Still on for the 18th, Margaret? Okay. Huh? Thursday. Thursday. Okay. Well, I'm going to be in the middle of the Caribbean on Thursday, so, but I'll be thinking about you. Yeah. Hello, we're there. Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. Are there any uh, comments we need to make before we get started? Jeff, you got anything? Okay. The 18th, yes. You know when Layla's surgery is? Okay. Okay. Any update on Jan? She's still in rehab? Okay. She's in Tulsa, Broken Arrow. Okay. Yeah, Pam rehab or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Still can't walk yet. Not weight bearing. Okay. All right. Anything else we need to mention this morning? I guess Catherine about the same. Last I talked to Jim, said she just wasn't doing too good. So need to definitely remember her in our prayers. Morning, Amy. How's Ivy? Okay. Okay. All right. Would y'all pray with me this morning? Our most gracious heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day, Lord, for this time we have to come together to Look at your word. Be with one another, Lord. And we pray that you would be with those we've mentioned this morning especially and put your special hand upon them, especially on Margaret and Leela and their upcoming surgeries this week or next week, that you would be with them, Lord, and help them to be successful and, and to get the result they desire. And pray for a quick healing and recovery for them. For Jen, Lord, and Pray for her, especially as she struggles uh, with getting back on her feet, and pray that she could get back to to get where she could move around again, Lord, and get weight bearing again. And we always hold up Catherine, Lord, to you and Jim, and, and the struggle she's having with cancer, and pray that you'd be with her and help her. With Tom, Lord, she'd help him with the struggles that he's having, and with Virginia, Lord Freeman, that you would be with her. And, Help her with the surgery she has upcoming, but also with the cancer also that she's battling, Lord, that you would be with her, that you'd help her with that, Lord. Pray for Buck's friend and his, his surgery, and pray that would be success. And we just pray, Lord, that you put your hand on all of us this morning, she'd bless us and bless those that are here, and just thankful for this time we have together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. We are moving down a little bit. I should have took some of them off, and I didn't do it. Talked a little bit about demons, Beelzebub last time. Moving through the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm uh, going to look a little bit this morning, and this is a subject that we talk about. Blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, right? The unforgivable uh, sin, the Bible says, to blaspheme. Uh, Jennifer, hi. How are you feeling? Good, good to see you. And um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. To blaspheme something, what does that mean exactly? Uh, you know, it's a word we throw around a lot in the Bible and we talk about a lot, but what does that actually mean to blaspheme, to, 
to blaspheme something. Uh, biblically speaking, you know, what does that mean to do that? Anybody can jump in here anytime. Huh? Right, to talk against, to talk falsely, to blaspheme is to talk falsely, to deny, to, uh, can be used in a lot kind of different contextual ideas, but, but it's kind of the idea we would call to slander is really maybe the word, or to lie against, to, to misrepresent. So when we, to God, to blaspheme God in the Bible, or to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, can, can really kind of mean in some ways, uh, it can mean to deny the existence of. It can mean to deny the power of. It can mean to falsely represent. Um, so those things all go into that idea uh, of what that exactly means. Jesus goes on here. Of course, he's got a parallel in Mark. He says, truly, Mark's probably the shorter, but truly I say to you, all sins should be forgiven the Son of Man, and whatever blasphemes they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Blasphemy of the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. Now, I would qualify this that we're fixing to talk about signs, and I think that has a lot to do with this passage. So you can blaspheme God. He said you can blaspheme the Son of Man, but you can't blaspheme the Spirit. Now, you got to think about this contextually. Maybe we should jump and come back. Um, let's jump and come back. Scribes and Pharisees teach want to see a sign from you. He answered and said to them, let, so let's, let's think about that as we're, because this is what we're going to. So let's, chronologically. So now we go back to this idea of the, how does Jesus perform the miracles that he performs? How does he do that? By the Holy Spirit. Right? How do we know that? Huh? Because he says, John says that Jesus has what? The Spirit without measure. Right? When did Jesus begin to perform signs and miracles? After his baptism. Right? What happened at the baptism of Jesus? Spirit descended, right? Spirit descended on him. Was Jesus human? Absolutely. Was Jesus God? Absolutely. That's awful confusing, isn't it? Was Jesus, so Jesus did this by the Spirit. So Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. So Jesus says, you can blaspheme against me. Now remember where we were last week. We're sandwiching this between two things. And if you try to take it out of the context of this, it's going to mess with your head. Okay, so last week... We talked about, back up, we talked about Beelzebub. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house, right? What did they say? He says, you're casting out demons by Beelzebub. So between we're casting out demons by Beelzebub and an evil and adulterous generation looks for a sign, between those two things we have, you can blaspheme against me, but don't blaspheme against the Spirit, because you never have forgiveness. Jesus was performing miracles and signs by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you denied that miracle, if you denied that sign, if you denied the power of that sign, you were blaspheming against the Spirit of God. You were saying, no, it's not the Spirit of God, right? It's, it's, it's a demon, you blasphemed against the Spirit. That's not God. It's a demon. You blasphemed against it if you say you deny the miracle, or the miracle doesn't exist, or the miracle comes from another place. Jesus says you can't deny the miracles. You can't deny what the Spirit does. So, so many times you and I, when we look at this passage over the years, we've taken this by itself, and we're like, well, how does it mean to blaspheme against the Spirit? I sure don't want to do that. That's an eternal sin. How do I do that? And over my life, I've heard a whole lot of explanations about this. You know, it's denying that, that God is salvation. It's denying, you know, uh, I don't really think that's what we're talking about here. Okay? 
I really don't. Because if you look at it between what we're talking about contextually, he's talking about you're denying what I'm doing. You're denying the power of what I'm doing. You're denying where that's coming from. And when you do that, you're blaspheming against the Spirit of God, and that's unforgivable. You know, John 6, Jesus says, uh, you follow me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. You remember that passage? It's kind of confusing in a way because when you ate the loaves and were filled, wasn't that a miracle within itself to feed the multitude? Wasn't that kind of a power of the Holy Spirit thing? But that Jesus was saying, but you're denying the signs. You're denying what's showing to you that I am the Son of God. And when you do that, you're blaspheming against the Spirit. So in the context of this, I don't know that you and I can can per se do this exactly how Jesus is accusing them of doing it because we're not there if that makes any sense so sometimes I think we really beat our head against the wall in this passage and we really beat ourselves up and we worry about it when I think contextually exactly what's going on here I'm not sure you and I are capable of that because yeah Right, but he's saying, won't we ever be forgiven? Right. Now are in the age to come. Right. In other words, it's whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit it shall not be forgiven him either this age or the age to come. It means there's no forgiveness. It's eternal sin. In other words, even in the age to come, he's still not going to forgive him of it. There's no forgiveness for this. Yeah, I think he means that, you know, basically, if you, look at, uh, if you look at Mark, Mark says he's guilty of an eternal sin. And if you look at the parallel to that, Matthew, it says either in this age or the age to come. That's an eternal sin. In other words, there's no forgiveness. You, yeah, you can't. And I really think, and maybe this is a stretch, but I really think it kind of ties into Hebrews where it says once they've tasted the heavenly gift and been enlightened, you can't renew them to repentance. I think it's kind of the same thing. I really think it's kind of the same, the same parallel in here. Um, he says, either make the tree good and the fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. He's speaking of himself. He says that the fruit of Jesus that he's speaking of here is the miracles, the signs, the stuff that he's doing. If you deny that, deny the power, then you deny the tree, right? You deny the tree because the fruit of the Spirit, if you deny the fruit of the Spirit, you deny the Spirit. So he says, that's what you do. So, so I think this is a, one of those things sometimes we, we kind of take it out of a context and we kind of put it on our, try to put it in our own lives and we struggle with it because it really doesn't have, I don't think, as much application as that. Can we blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Absolutely we can, beyond a doubt. Is that a forgivable sin? Can we repent and turn to God? I, absolutely, right? I mean, that's grace, right? As a Christian, if we repent of what we don't need, even if we at some point in our lives deny the Holy Spirit, we still can return to God. So I don't think this is, this is the application here. Um, these are people denying the Holy Spirit's power working in Jesus Christ. And they're seeing this with their own eyes. And they're saying, oh, well, that's not God. That's not the Spirit. Or that's, that's the devil. Um, they're denying it. And for that, there's no, there's no forgiveness for that. Like I said, I really think it ties into Hebrews. Any comments? Anybody ever think of this this way before? Are we hoeing new ground? Plowing new ground this morning. That's good. That's what we want to do. We want to plow new ground. Okay. Yeah, there's some things in the Bible because Jesus isn't here in front of us. There's certain things we can't we can't do that they could do. I mean, they could deny him directly. We we can't. I mean, we have faith in what he did. These people were seeing what Jesus did. They were seeing the Holy Spirit working. They were seeing it with their own eyes, and they were denying it. You and I, we can't do that because we'll never see that with our own eyes. So there's things in the Bible. You always have to ask yourself in Scripture, you know, is it to us or for us? 
right? Is it to us or for us? I think that's something you always have to ask yourself in the Bible. Because some things are written, and they're not really to us. It doesn't mean they're not for us. It doesn't mean we can't learn from it. It doesn't mean we can't glean from it. It doesn't mean they're not things that we need to know. But they're not to us because we're not in that situation. Does that make any sense? You know, we can't be that person. We can't. So we kind of have to ask ourselves. And I think that's a problem. That's one thing that's nice about going through this chronologically. You can see it between in the context of what Jesus is really talking about, the discourse. So many times when we take Scripture out of that context and we don't understand what's going on, it's easy for us to struggle because we simply don't understand the context of what's being said. So Jesus here is pretty specific. And then he goes on, you brood of vipers. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I think in this, in this instance, it was saying that the miracles Jesus was performing were not of God. Are saying that they were not truly miracles. For us to blaspheme would be for us to speak against or to deny the existence of God or the de- existence of the Spirit. Um, totally disrespectful. That would be the idea. Slandering God's word would be blaspheme against God. We could blaspheme against God. Um, the problem is, is that that isn't an unforgivable sin scripturally for us we can turn back to god we can get away but there is repentance for us so i think that's what i mean contextually you know people are like oh boy if i blast him against the holy spirit i'm done there's no way back i'm i'm finished but that's not the gospel you know so yeah go ahead becky okay Well, I didn't say we can't see miracles. We, we definitely see miracles. But we can't see Jesus doing what Jesus did for miracles. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, yeah, let me qualify that statement. You know, it's a little different. You know, that's, we forget that with, you know, apostles and people like that. These people saw this. I mean, they saw it with their own eyes. I mean, it was, it was a different deal. Yeah, go ahead, Gary. Right. That's a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To attribute God's work to Satan is a huge thing. And he says, You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Because he's going into this, a tree by the fruit. He led right into that, you know. You see what I do is good because I'm good. But then he says, Look at you. You know, what you say, you brood of vipers, he calls them. Um, He says, a good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. An evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Man, that's big stuff, isn't it? Every careless word. By your words. You know, Jesus is big about that. Judge the way you judge. You'll receive, what did he say in the Sermon on the Mount, right? It'll be measured to you the way you measure it. Um, Our words will judge us. What we speak on this earth will judge us. Um, You know, I had a parrot for a while. You all know that. And, you know, parrots are quite interesting animals because... They repeat everything they've ever heard, even from their previous owners. And my parrot had a previous owner. And there were certain things you didn't say around my parrot. Because if you did, he would uh, lash back at you. And uh, 
And one of those things was Jerry. Didn't say Jerry. If he said Jerry, he'd go, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and some other things. <laughs> so he just didn't say that around my parents. <laughs> so... So the truth is, though, is that, you know, if you could repeat, have something repeat back your words to you, would you be proud of what you said, right? If you're judged by the words you speak, what are your words, right? I think it's a really hard, really big statement to say you'll be judged, you're judging yourself by what you say, by how you act, by the words that you use with your life. That's a really big thing to me to think about during the day because we all use a lot of words. And, you know, are those words worthy of, of us? Are they worthy of God? Um, will we be judged by that? We judge by the good we do, the bad we do, uh, what comes out of our mouth. God says we'll have to give an accounting for it. Even, even a careless word, he says. Even a careless word. So it's important, right? James says the tongue is a deadly, a deadly poison, right? The tongue is... Is, is deadly so we need to be careful what we say and then he leads in to sign some of the scribes and pharisees said to him teach want to see a sign from you but he said an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign and yet no sign will be given it but the sign of jonah the prophet i could spend about a week right here anyway but what's he talking about signs well they want to see a sign what has he been doing what are they saying what are they wanting from him what kind of sign do they want What's the difference between a sign and a miracle? <laughs> What's the difference between a sign and a miracle, right? Signs, wonders, and miracles. A sign is what? What's the difference? Anybody know? Well, what's a sign do? Points in a direction. Proves something, doesn't it? Um, signs are for information, right? And it's like the old guys in Louisiana that the guy's driving down the road and the sign said, uh, the sign said, turn back now. And then, then, then there's down the road a little further. Up, another sign says, the end is near. And some guy drove by in a pickup and rolled his window down. He says, you religious fanatics. And then he drove off in the river. And the guy says, maybe we should have just put bridge out. <laughs> right? So signs can be misleading, can't they? Signs can be, and a sign is something that points to me as being God, being Christ. Part of this, um, the prophetic sign that they're looking for. What kind of sign do they want from Jesus to prove that he's the Messiah? What do they want to see? Right, conquer. They wanted to be a king. You're right. There's a lot of Old Testament things that pointed to Jesus, right? Malachi says that Elijah will come before the Lord. They were looking for that. And Jesus says, John the Baptist, the Elijah that was to come, right? All these prophecies that had to be fulfilled, born of a virgin, uh, born of the tribe of Judah, born of the lineage of David, born... They're saying, show us a sign to prove us. They're not letting a miracle. They saw a lot of miracles. So this isn't, they're not saying, show us another, heal another blind man, heal another lame man, feed another 5,000, raise another dead person. It's not what they want. They're wanting a sign to verify that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Give us a sign. And Jesus says, I'm not going to do it. The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah the prophet. That is, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. Right? And he says, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation of the judgment, will condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south, who come to see Solomon in all his glories, who we're talking about, the queen of the south will rise up, with this generation, the judgment will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. You know, Jesus is telling him, he's saying, you, you want a sign and I'm not going to provide that for you. I'm not going to give, why, why won't he just do it? Why won't he just say it? Why won't he just prove I'm the son of God? Why won't he just lay it out there? Why doesn't he do it? Why won't he do it?
Yeah. Yeah, I think that he might have met resistance uh, that wasn't the plan they were looking for. He wasn't, in a lot of ways, who they were looking for. The sign that they wanted him to give, he, he would not give because that's not what he was here to do. And he told them plain and simply, he says, there'll be a sign. As, as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights. And, and I think that we, and, it, and, it, and he says, you know, you're going to be judged by people who came to hear the preaching and they repented and you don't repent. Someone greater than Jonah is here. Someone greater than Solomon is here. And they're going to rise up and judge you on that day because you failed to repent. You failed to hear what I had to say. So in the middle of all this stuff, we went from demons, it's by the power of demons, we went to blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, denying uh, the power of the sign, and now we're down to this point that is saying, I'm not going to give you a sign, but the sign of Jonah. But let's not get a sign and a miracle confused here, because they were seeing a lot of miracles. But that wasn't proving to them what they wanted to know. So it kind of fits into this whole line of reasoning. Yeah. They're just taking everything that they had basically made their religion from and taking that away and making it just more structured. So they were they're they're taking it against that whole idea that they can get this get this from Jesus. Yeah. And they, they wanted to I mean, how hard would it be to walk away from your livelihood and everything? So they were probably the hardest Oh, absolutely. Jesus, you know, didn't fit into their mold in any in any respect. Um, he didn't come to them. He went to some fishermen in Galilee. He he wasn't a military. He wasn't militant. He wasn't looking to overthrow the government. Uh, he was existing within a corrupt system, but yet uh, asking them to do the same thing. Um, you know, it wasn't what they wanted at all. Like Buck says, it was going to destroy their livelihood. It was going to destroy what they had been raised up with. This wasn't just we're going to make Judaism the thing. This is we're going to turn it into something else. And that was a big thing for them. Um, they were resistant to him. Now, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I will return to my house in which I came. When it comes, it will find it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. This is kind of a weird thing chronologically in the Gospels if this winds up right here, but it does. Oh, I've heard so many ideas on this over my life. Um, and you all probably have ideas about this. Um, goes and takes along seven other spirits more wicked than itself. They go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will be. With this evil generation, why does he say that? What's the comparison? What, what's he trying to tell them here? Do you think? We've just looked at a lot of things. He talked about them being a brood of vipers. He says that you're, you know, uh, what comes out of you is evil. Um, and then he goes into this. And he says, this is how it's going to be with this generation. What's the comparison? You know, I think when you look at the first of this and you think, oh, well, that's talking about a demon. And when a demon comes out, I've heard this my whole life. When a demon comes out and you don't fill it up with something else, that demon's going to come back and bring seven more demons. I've heard people say that. I've heard people say that it has to do with addiction, that if people are addicted to something and they get that addiction out of their life and they get their life cleaned up and they don't put Jesus in there, put God in there, put something else in there, that they're going to fall back into that addiction. It's going to be a lot worse than it was the first time. I've heard this used a lot of different ways in my life, a lot of different contextual thoughts. But don't forget what it says at the end of this. It says this is how, this is the way it will be with this evil generation. The last state will be worse than the first. Yeah, go ahead. Right. It's not exclusive, and he's using an example, a parallel to that. But he says, um, 
So basically, if you take something out and don't put something in, let's just go on a basic premise here, and let's get away from the idea. Let's just go on a basic premise. If you take something out of your life and you don't, you're going to fill it with something else. If you don't fill it with something good, or then chances are you're going to wind up filling it with something bad. You're going to wind up worse than you were. That's kind of just, I think Jesus is using that idea. But then he says this generation, this evil generation. In other words, they're, what they have is going to be taken away from them. Buck kind of hit on it. Judaism, the idea of all that is going to be taken away. That's going to be taken out of their lives. That's no longer going to be of any effect. The effect of the sacrifice of the temple, all that's going to be gone. And if you take all that away and you don't put something back in its place, which is what Jesus is bringing to put back in its place, then you're going to wind up worse off than you were. Yeah, go ahead. I think it is. I think it's a double thing. He's using an individual idea to parallel it to the bigger idea of Judaism, right? He's like piggybacking it on the back of it. He says, this is how it is with man. If you take something out and you don't replace it with something, chances are you're going to wind up worse than you were, which I think that's true. But then he also is paralleling that to this generation and saying, listen, if I take away the temple, take away the law, take away all that, you don't replace it with something, you're going to wind up worse than you were at the first. Yeah. I don't know. It's impossible to tell. You know, the problem is we don't have, uh, you know, seven. Uh, you know, the idea here, seven is a perfect number, of course, in the Bible. We understand that. Not necessarily is to be taken literally oftentimes in Scripture. It's more of a perfection number. So it's more the idea that something more perfect is going to, more perfect evil will replace the evil that you had, if you want to look at it in a numerology idea. Or if you want to take it in a literal seven, um, it could be. We talked about demons and demon possession, and that doesn't seem to necessarily be the case in the Bible of them coming back and bringing more with them. Matter of fact, the only multiple possession we know of in the Bible is legion. That's the only example we have of multiple possession in the Bible, and that appears to be way more than seven. So I think that you can't, to take it in a literal sense, I think you're going to have issues um, but I think if you take it in the idea of seven being a perfect number and the idea that if you empty something out of yourself and you don't fill it back in, that you're going to have a more perfect evil within you, I, can, uh, I think that's a more, more in-line idea, interpretation, than to take, it in a literal, to take it in a literal sense. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think you can take it a lot of ways in respect of that. Um, you know, I've often, like I said, you know, you can take a lot of application. I've heard so many different views on this and commentaries over the years. Um, I think if you take the basic context of it, it's that people are not going to be empty. Okay? We're just not going to be empty. You're going to fill yourself with something. Well, it's just how we are, right? You're going to watch stuff. You're going to see stuff. You're going to hear stuff. You're going to fill yourself with something. Life's about what you fill yourself with, whether that be good or bad, evil. And I think if you don't fill yourself with what's good, inherently the alternative to that is you're going to fill yourself with what's evil. So, you know, there's a lot of context, but I think in the context Jesus was really trying to get to them was is that, you know, I'm taking this away from you, and if you don't put something back in its place, you're going to be empty. You think that they do take the bare minimum needs of that, and then have them chase you, and then fall into those? I mean, 
Yeah, I think you see a lot of Hebrews in this, a lot of that idea. If you've tasted the heavenly gifts and once been enlightened, you know that there's no other way to call you to repentance. I think you see a lot of Hebrews in this, um, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I think you see it in that respect. Oh, boy, we get all three now. We're lining up. Uh, synoptically, all, this is in all three Gospels. Um, and it's about his mother and his brothers arriving, and it's interesting uh, they can't get to him. Why did they come to see him? I don't know. I don't have a clue. His brothers weren't believing in him till after the resurrection. His mother was always fairly close. Why they were wanting to talk to him, we don't know that. We don't know what was going on. The crowds were big, as we know. They couldn't even get to him. Someone tells him that they're looking for him. And then Jesus makes a unique response, doesn't he? A uniquely Christian response, I think, from a Jew, right? He says, who really is my family? You know, that's really a Christian thought more than a Judaism thought. The Jews weren't so much about that idea of family, about lineage. But, you know, that's really a Christian thought. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all one body. We're all Christ and children of God. Therefore, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. <coughs> What's our most important family, right? Well, our physical family is important, I hope, to us. But Jesus answered and he said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, if you look at Mark, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. Stretching out his hand, Matthew says, toward his disciples, he answered and said, You know why I bring that up is the differences in them gospels is so important. Because it tells you that they're all unique. Right? They're not just the same. It's perspective and point of view. And we know they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, but we get a unique example of who's writing it at the same time. Um, if they were all the same, it would inherently would say they can't be right because if you ever put somebody on a witness, two people or three people on a witness stand, and they give the judge exactly the same story, what's the judge going to do? He's going to throw it out, right? Because none of us see things the same way. The very fact that the Gospels are different in wording attests to their, to their reality, attests to their validity. And I think it's important that we see that looking about, stretching out his hand. Behold my, my mother and my brothers. And then Jesus says, whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. But look at Matthew. You know, Matthew's the Jew, right? Look at Matthew. Matthew says, whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I like that. He is my brother and sister and mother. Matthew says, whoever does the will of my father. See that in Matthew? That's really interesting, isn't it? If you look here, he says, whoever does the will of God. But I really like that. Whoever does the will of my father, Jesus says. My father. Now that would have got him right there, right? Because they didn't ever want to hear that anyway from Jesus. I really think it's neat that he says that. He is my brother. He is, he is my mother. He is my sister. You know, who's our forever family? Right here. Right? I mean, all my physical family, I'm going to tell you, they're not all saved. wish they were, but they're not. Right? This family is my forever family. Right? That's a big thing in my life. This is my forever family. Jesus understands that. That's what he said. They're really my mother. They're really my brother. They're really who who I should be concerned about. And that's what family is. And that's what the church should be. It should be family. We should understand that we're in this for eternity, not just for here, 
but for eternity. Jesus understood that, and you and I should understand that. Are there any comments? And then Jesus, as he says, whoever does the will, immediately he goes into what? Spreading the seed, right? What's the will of God? That we spread the seed, that we spread the kingdom. He was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered, and he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, which we don't have. But we do have this one, saying, saying the sower went out to sow and as he sowed and some seeds fell beside the road and the birds came and ate them up and others fell on the rocky places this is only in Matthew this is unique to Matthew interestingly enough where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil when the sun had risen they were scorched because they had no root they withered away others fell among the thorns and the thorns came up and choked them out and others fell on good soil and yielded a crop some a hundred some sixty some thirty he owes ears to hear let him hear so why do you speak to them in parables right it's a pretty blunt question why don't you just tell us straight up why do you speak to them in parables jesus said to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been granted for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he who have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Jesus uses that a lot, that idea of whoever has, more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Um, Jesus says, you have the right to know the mysteries of the kingdom. They don't, but they will, because the mysteries of the kingdom will be revealed. But at this particular time in history, that wasn't the case. Jesus says, you're privy to this, do these parables. But then Jesus says, I'm going to explain it to you, and we're out of time. So I won't be here next Sunday. But uh, so Sunday after next, we will explain it. <laughs> so thanks for your time this morning. <laughs> hey, Amy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm good. <laughs>